So when we were doing these on Friday, we uh, we did forget something, and the reason we forgot it is simply because I don't have an arrow pointing to it anywhere on this diagram. So you do need to add in okay, a line here just so that uh, we can see sort of what's going on here. So draw it maybe right in over here just to the kind of open space within the cell because it isn't actually open space. Okay? It's a fluid medium that uh, resides within the cell that helps with intracellular transport. Intracellular means within the cell. So it helps things to move within the cell. And it is called cytoplasm. Alright, so we forgot to label that on Friday, so just add it to your diagram, cytoplasm. It'll be very important later on when we start talking about uh, how intracellular transport occurs. Okay? Cytoplasm has a consistency similar to water. All right? It's not like jelly or anything like that. Its consistency is, consistency is pretty much water, like any other uh, fluid kind of within your body. Okay. Alright, the plant cell. So... Most of this stuff should be pretty easy to do because most of it is the same. Did we get to, uh, we got to the ones that were different, right? We talked about the uh, chloroplasts down here. All right, but we'll just label them anyway. Chloroplasts. Okay. Uh, we talked about the cell wall. Okay, and how it's made out of cellulose, that stuff that we can't digest. All right, uh, cell membrane is just inside of that. So that's this one here. Okay, uh, and the other differences were the presence of the large water vacuole here in the middle. Okay, so water vacuole. And we said that the purpose of that was to help support the cell. And we talked about what a plant looks like when it's not watered. It wilts, and that's why these, these things get drained. Okay, and the outer membrane of the uh, water vacuole was called the tonoplast. Okay, and then everything else is the same as in the animal cell. The dark dot inside of the nucleus is the nucleolus. Okay, and nucleus. And the outside of the nucleus would be the nuclear membrane, right. Okay, now, um, I had a few people email me over the weekend about labeling their diagrams, and Mr. Coderre, you know, I couldn't see very much, uh, you know, what should I label, and the answer is the same as it was last week. Don't label it if you're not sure, but here's some tips for you. You could probably see the nucleus in all of the cells you looked at, all right. If you can see the nucleus, you see where the outside of it is, agreed? Can you label the outside of it as nuclear membrane then? Yeah, in the same way that you don't actually see the cell membrane, but it's there, okay, it's the outside of the cell. If you can see the outside of the cell, you label it cell membrane, all right? So things like that can certainly be labeled, all right? If you can see empty space within the cell, you can label that as cytoplasm. That's the one we talked about this morning, and that's when I realized I hadn't done that one, okay? It was after I got a few emails and looked at a few people's diagrams, all right? Um, so... Those are the kind of things that you can most likely see on the ones that you have. Again, I'm not really going to be looking on this first lab for accuracy of labeling. I'm looking more at format of the lab drawings. Are they in the format that I showed you? Okay, things like that. Did you put all your all your labels to one side? Not like this diagram, because this is a bad example. It's, this isn't a lab diagram, obviously, because all the labels go everywhere. On yours, they all go to the right-hand side and stuff like that. Okay, uh, what's the orange thing? over here. Mitochondria, okay, those burn sugar for energy, which is why they're in both kinds of cells. What are the little brown dots that are sometimes also on here? Ribosomes, right, they make protein, which is why there are so many of them everywhere within the cell, right? It's important to, the cell needs to make lots of different proteins at all times. Okay, uh, this thing here okay, is kind of pointing at one of the fibers. Okay, we will call that again a microfiber, microfilament. Okay, microfiber, either one is fine. Okay, you could also have microtubules. All right, but typically you don't see those as much in a plant cell, which is why there aren't any labeled on here. All right, let's uh, go back over to the left-hand side here. The blue stuff with all the ribosomes on it. Rough ER. 
And again, you can write ER on a quiz okay, or a test. That'll be fine. You don't have to write out endoplasmic reticulum, although you should know that that's what ER stands for. Okay. Um, and then this stuff here, without the ribosomes on it, smooth ER. Okay, uh, this this thing here is actually just a small water vacuole. I think we talked about that on Friday, but we'll label it again anyway. Okay, and we'll just write small H2O vacuole. Um, and then what's the orange thing here at the bottom? The Golgi apparatus, right? The garbage man of the cell. Oh yeah, I did remember to put the garbage out. <laughs> this reminded me it was garbage day. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so that's all of it there. Oh, except cytoplasm. We don't have cytoplasm on here. So again, just draw yourself a line pointing anywhere into the cell that's kind of empty. Got some room over here so we can do that. Cytoplasm. Here. That is also a mitochondria. It's just showing you without it being cross-sectioned. Okay, so this is showing you like the whole cell has been cross-sectioned here, which means cut. And then you're looking at kind of the inside of a few things. Just this mitochondria wasn't sectioned, so it, that's what they look like from the outside. You wouldn't see, even if you saw a mitochondria through a microscope, which is sometimes possible, you'll never see the folds in it. Okay, through a light microscope anyway. Terry. Okay, oh, the little holes. Yes. Um, these are, oh shoot, and I remembered what they were um, on Friday. They're not actually something you have to label. Oh shoot, John asked me what they were on Friday and I remembered and now I don't remember. And he's not here to remind me because he would remember. Um, <sighs> feels like Monday, doesn't it? I'll get back to you on that. It's not something you're going to have to label. They, the purpose of these is that uh, plant cells will exchange cytoplasm through these holes. Okay, and so they can help to transport materials a little bit better uh, that way. Okay. All right, any other questions there? Okay, so hang on to those. What do you suppose tomorrow's quiz will be about? Yes, I will put a picture of a cell up on the board and you will label it. It will not be one of these. All right? I'm expecting some transference to go on here so that you could look at another cell diagram and actually be able to say, oh, well, that's a mitochondria. Um, well, you, you won't know which ones I'm going to pick. Because, see, I'm going to tweet it, but I'm not going to say which ones I'm going to make you label. I will just show you the picture. Otherwise, you'll only study the ones that I ask you to label. That won't do what I want it to do. Yeah. Right. But at least you'll have the picture ahead of time, and you can do some comparison and figure out what everything is. Okay, any other questions? All right, then we're going to move on to the longest, most drawn out, you have to sit there and listen to me lesson. Boy, that's really not a good lead up, is it? Um, that you're going to have, unfortunately, in this uh, in this course. And that is because I got to tell you what each and every little thing in the cell does. All right. Now, this is the part of the of the unit where you are going to want to do a lot of reading review. All right, where you, you know, read it over you know, maybe rewrite it, paraphrase it, memorize it, all right, make flashcards. Flashcards are a great idea when it comes to, um, when it comes to remembering the parts of the cell and what they do. There are also a few apps that you can get for free and a couple that you have to pay a dollar ninety nine for, okay, um, that have to do with diagrams of the cell and cell labeling. Hudson Alpha I cell is one of them. And... Uh, what's the other one? Cell stain, I think, is the other one. Um, but they, they, I mean, they're decent. You know, the, you can, it's a three-dimensional cell. You can rotate it. It's better than looking at my notes, probably. All right. Essentially says the same stuff. There's, I'm not going to tell you anything that they wouldn't tell you on there. 
All right. So if you're looking for some other way to study that, that's maybe a little more fun. Uh, those there are apps on the uh, um, iTunes Store that you can get that have to do with cell labeling. All right. So what we got to go over here: operations and functions of the cell and membrane transport. Okay. So we got to talk about first off what each and every part of the cell does, and then we'll get to how the cell transports material within the cell, in and out of the cell, across the membrane, okay, and stuff like that. And there's a lot of stuff in this unit about cellular transport. Even when we get into the part of the unit where we're talking about multicellular organisms, we always come back to cells carry out the basic functions of the organism. And as one of those functions is transporting material. And because really, as a multicellular organism, you use the same principles to transport material that your individual cells do. Certainly, we have a little bit of help. We've got a circulatory system that pumps blood. Right? But in the end, the stuff still has to get out of our blood and into our cells by the same method that it, you know, it would if you had a single cell transporting material. All right, uh, so we have to understand the significance of compartmentalization of cells. All right, That's going to be kind of an important word because we are dealing with um, in this lesson anyway, only one kind of cell. All right, and I don't mean plant or animal. In this case, I mean that there are essentially two kinds of organisms on Earth. There are prokaryotic organisms and eukaryotic organisms. We will be dealing with the latter. Okay. Eukaryotic organisms are the ones that have cells like ours. All right. They have organelles inside that have their own membranes that separate them from the rest of the cell. Those kinds of cells are far more efficient, okay, and things like that. They have compartmentalization. All right. There are little compartments within the cell. Each of the organelles is its own separate compartment. Okay. And there's advantages to that. Okay, know the role of each organelle. Yeah, you're going to be tested on that repeatedly. Okay, I guarantee you that on your unit exam, there will be a diagram of the cell that you will be asked to label a few parts of and give me their functions. So that's definitely something you're going to want to review okay, uh, regularly. Um, understand that cells are a complex system of interdependent processes. What does interdependent mean? Right, they depend on each other. All right. But not just on each other, but if one part of the cycle breaks down, it doesn't just affect the next thing in line. It affects everything beyond that, and possibly even has effects for processes that go on behind that process. All right? Interdependent means any cog in the wheel breaks, the whole wheel stops turning. Okay. Um, understand how the cell carries out its functions. Again, which point of the cell theory is that? Second point, all things are made up of cells. Cells carry out basic functions. Okay, we're going to talk about how the cell carries out those functions because they are the basic functions of the organism. And fifthly, understand how materials are transported across the cell membrane and within the cell. We're really going to go over kind of the three major types of transport and then look at a few of the kind of subcategories. Questions there? All right. So compartments within the cell. Eukaryotic cells have something called compartmentalization. All right, and it says here, obviously, present only in eukaryotic cells. The advantage of that is, is that a lot of the metabolic processes, okay, the things that your cell needs to do to stay alive, are not compatible with each other. All right. Uh, for example, if you want to digest food, especially any food made of proteins and things like that properly, you need chemicals, enzymes, and things like that that will break down your food material. What's your food material made out of? What do you eat? Cookies. Okay. What are cookies made out of? Hmm? There's some sugars. Okay. What else? Is there fiber in there? Okay. Essentially, everything we eat was at least at one time living, and as a result, made of cells. So if you've got these organelles, or you've got this process with going on within your cell that's supposed to break down stuff that cells are made out of, isn't that kind of dangerous? Because if that goes on within your cell, it's going to eat your cell. 
so it needs to have its own separate compartment. That makes the process able to be highly concentrated and much more efficient. Were that process to just go on within the cytoplasm of the cell, well, then it could digest other parts of your cell, and that would be inefficient, to say the least. All right. Uh, in your mitochondria, when your mitochondria are burning sugar for energy, okay, that process generates a lot of excess heat. The mitochondria has a double membrane that helps to insulate the rest of the cell against the heat produced. All right. Is it good for your body to get too hot? No, you don't function very well when you have a fever. In fact, if your fever gets hot enough, you lose consciousness, you get delirious, right? Like it's it can be it can be fatal if your temperature gets too high. All right. So lots of these processes don't work well with each other. So if we have their own separate compartment where they take place, that process can be done very very efficiently without having to worry about its effect on the rest of the cell. Everyone follow? Right? And like it says in here, it's like in your house. Okay? In your house, you have two or three different environments. Okay? And these environments have to be kept separate from each other because the processes that go on in them aren't compatible with each other. What temperature do you keep your house at? Around 20, 21, somewhere in there, right? If you leave food out on the counter at 21 degrees, what happens to it? It spoils, right? It goes bad, right? Because you know, bacteria and fungus and things like that can grow pretty well at 21 and a half degrees Celsius. Well, where do you put your food? You put it in the fridge. Okay. Why do you put it in the fridge? Because the fridge is cold. All right. Do you want to live in the fridge? Probably not. I mean, there's lots of food in there. Okay. But you probably don't want to live in there because it's cold. All right. And it's kind of small. And there's shelves and stuff. Okay. But it's too cold in there for you to live effectively. It's about four or five degrees Celsius. Okay. That's not comfortable for you. That's a separate environment that does a job not compatible with keeping your house at a comfortable temperature. And then you may also have a freezer. Okay. Like a deep freeze or something like that. And you keep that at about minus 15 degrees Celsius. You're certainly not going to live in there. All right. It's far too cold. All right, water freezes, your cells rupture, that's not good for you. All right, so we have these three separate environments. What's going on in those environments is not compatible with each other. I don't want, uh, you know, the stuff I want to drink to be in the deep freeze. It's kind of hard to drink when it's in a solid form. Okay, and I don't want necessarily, uh, you know, my, my food that I want to eat also to be frozen. So I want to keep them cool, cool enough to stop them from spoiling, okay, but not so cold that I can't eat them. All right, everybody follow me there? So we got your cell works the same way. It maintains separate environments because then the jobs that go on in those environments have their ideal conditions in which to operate rather than having to have an average. If your cell was like, uh, or if your house, sorry, was like a cell with no compartments, it would be like keeping your house at 10 degrees to have a happy medium between all three processes. Okay, your food still spoils, you're uncomfortable, and you can't keep anything frozen. Right? So, well, it's not a happy medium. It's somewhere in the middle. Prokaryotic cells, the ones without these compartments, that's what they're like. Okay? They are a house kept at 10 degrees Celsius. Nothing works super efficient, but it works. All right? Which is why prokaryotic cells tend to stay very, very small and very, very simple. And that's also why you don't see any multicellular prokaryotic organisms. They cannot become specialized if they don't have all these separate compartments. Okay. All right. Questions on that? Okay. So the uh, the idea of compartmentalization is important. You need to be able to tell me, okay, um, why that's an advantage. Okay. So, like we said, it allows cells to become larger. Okay. Prokaryotes don't have those compartments, and as a result, they're much smaller. To give you an idea here, in scale, here's an animal cell. We can't even see what even a quarter of it in this picture. Okay. Here's a bacterium, right? Quite a bit smaller than an animal cell, and a virus, obviously even smaller than that. All right. So, in the sense of scale, prokaryotic cells don't get very big because, well, they're not very efficient. They don't produce a lot of of energy because they can't. Right? They're trying to do processes not compatible with each other in the same place. All right. DNA. Where will you find it in the cell? In the nucleus. Okay. Nucleus is a good place to keep DNA. It's got a very selective membrane that doesn't essentially allow anything except DNA in. 
All right, and that's important. We don't want things getting in where our DNA is kept because we don't want the DNA to get messed up. All right, it's like if you have um, like this big manuscript that you're trying to keep, you know, that you're writing, and you're trying not to let anything happen to it, and then suddenly somebody lets a kid with a crayon in. Okay, goodbye, beautiful manuscript. There's going to be a whole bunch of mistakes and crayon all over it. Okay, you don't want that happening to the genetic information of your cell. All right, because suddenly instead of you know, having the code that makes insulin, you now have stickmen and, you know, whatever else. It doesn't, you, know, you just don't want that to happen. So your DNA has to be kept protected within the nucleus. All right. Um, now, the, the form that DNA gets stored in is called chromatin. And essentially that means not in the, the usual collections that we see it. Whenever we see DNA, we usually see it in the form of a chromosome. Okay, a chromosome is actually like if you took um, like a, a stick and wound yarn around it. All right, that's that's what a chromosome is like. It's a whole bunch of DNA all kind of rolled on top of itself and coiled together into a small, compact kind of unit. Most of the time, in your cell, the DNA is like taking a ball of yarn and unrolling it completely and just throwing it in a pile. Right? That's what your DNA looks like inside of your nucleus most of the time. Okay. I know that seems kind of disorganized, but then your cell can get to any part of it. If it's coiled up in chromosomes, most of it is buried, and, and it can't find the parts it needs very easily. So it's just com it's, it's like a messy bedroom. Okay? But y you can, if it's your bedroom, you probably know where stuff is. Right? So it's kind of like that. All right, so that's, that's all um, in there. And protein synthesis is controlled from the nucleus because the nucleolus okay, is essentially the thing that controls protein synthesis. All right, and we'll talk about how protein synthesis happens in a minute here. Now, this is what the, elect the um, nucleus looks like under an electron microscope. Okay, it's kind of bumpy, almost looks like, you know, it's got goosebumps or something. Okay. Well, those goosebumps are actually kind of our, our pores that can open and close and allow DNA in and out of the nucleus. All right. So they're like um, little, like the iris of your eye. They can kind of open and close like that okay, and allow stuff in and out. Okay. This is what those pores look like under even greater magnification. Okay, so you can see that they can uh, kind of iris open and shut, right? Allow things in and out, and then even greater magnification. You can actually see the uh, the stuff that the membrane is made out of, and how it kind of interlocks, almost like a fabric, okay, to create a barrier against anything getting in or out. Everybody with me there? All right. Why would why would you usually find rough ER really close to the nucleus? Because you almost always do. You don't like if you can if you look really closely at a nucleus, it almost looks like every nucleus has a goatee. Alright? Because there's always this this rough ER kind of hanging off of it. Okay? Why would the rough ER want to be close? What's all over the rough ER? What are the little dark things? The bumps? Ribosomes. What do ribosomes do? They make protein. Well, if you control protein synthesis from here. Okay, from the nucleolus, it would be smart to keep the things that make protein and the stuff that transports protein close. That's more efficient, and that's usually why you find them close together. All right, so here's how your DNA makes materials. This is a greatly simplified explanation of how protein synthesis happens, okay, but it's generally right, and you won't need to know any more detail than this. Inside of your nucleus is your DNA. That's this blue stuff here, the double-stranded stuff. Okay? When your cell needs something, it goes to the section of the DNA that tells it how to make that, and it pulls it apart. All right? Because as you learned in Science 9, DNA strands are complementary. Right? A always pairs with T, and C always pairs with G. Right? So you only need to see one side. Everyone knows what the other side would be. So it copies one side and sends a single-stranded copy out. That single-stranded copy is called RNA, ribonucleic acid. Okay. That gets out through the nuclear pores and heads down to a ribosome. Okay. The ribosome grabs onto it and starts translating it. 
Okay, it sees a you know a string of of base pairs. Okay, like let's say it says it sees A C T G A C E. Okay, so T sorry. Um, and it's got that and it goes. Okay, that means I need this stuff. So it goes and it it goes out into the cell and it grabs the stuff it needs and puts that together. All right. So what you see then is these things here are bringing those pieces into the cell and attaching them onto longer and longer protein chains. All right? So they go out and look for amino acids that are used to make proteins. So your DNA tells it, I need this piece, then I need this piece, then I need this piece, and then this one, and then this one, and pretty soon you've got a completed protein, usually about the time you get to the end of the strand of RNA. Okay? Now that protein can go out and do whatever job it needed to do. All right? So very simply, your nucleolus copies your DNA, sends the copy out into the cell, the ribosome grabs it, reads it, makes the protein, and you're done. Okay, that's kind of the process of protein synthesis, greatly simplified. Okay. Now, what happens to this RNA after the job has been done? Your cell breaks it back down. Okay, turns it back into the raw materials, and then it can be uh, used again. All right, so that's essentially what I said here. Okay, nucleolus produces RNA, which is a copy of the cell's DNA. Okay, and that's used to synthesize the proteins. Okay, uh, at the ribosomes. Questions on that? Okay, you're not going to need to know any of the terms in here, like RNA polymerase or transcriptase or anything like that. You're not going to need to know about any of those enzymes or any of that. Just know the general process. Okay, now, why don't we make protein in the nucleus? Right. St only DNA is allowed into the cell, or sorry, into the nucleus. N raw materials needed to make proteins are not allowed in there, because some of them could be toxic. So, all of that stuff has to be done outside, in the cytoplasm, where all the stuff you need to build things is located. All right. Okay. Inside of the cell, much of the cytoplasm, much of the space within the cell is actually taken up with endoplasmic reticulum. It runs everywhere because its job is to transport stuff, all right? especially the, uh, the rough ER. We'll talk first, though, about the smooth ER. Okay? Within the membrane of the smooth ER, okay, lots of jobs are performed. Okay? We said this on Friday, but the smooth ER is probably the busiest organelle in the cell. All right? Now, on a test... How many functions of the smooth ER do you suppose you need to tell me? Let's say if you give me at least one that is correct, I'll be okay with that. All right, because you're only going to have a finite amount of space to write stuff. All right, so if on a quiz, smooth ER, was, if it said label and give the function of the following organelles and smooth ER was one of them, you write smooth ER and one of these things. All right, the big thing that smooth ER does is it makes lipids. Okay, now what are lipids? What's another name for lipids? Fats. Okay, your smooth ER makes fats. Fats are important. If you don't get fat in your diet, okay, it, you're not a healthy person because that's what your cell membranes are made of. That's what all the membranes of all the organelles in your cell are made of. If you don't get fats, your cell membranes will get weak, all right, and lots of your cells will rupture and die. So you don't want that. You do have to have some fat in your diet. Not as much as we consume as North Americans, but you need some. All right, you can't just eat like uh, lettuce. Okay, you can't live on that. All right, uh, so you have to have some fats within your diet. So put some salad dressing on there, then you got some fats. Okay, um, so it it makes lipids within within the smooth ER. That's one of the things it does, and those lipids are used to either make new membrane, repair damaged membrane, okay, and things like that. All right, um, complex carbohydrates get broken down into simple sugars. Okay? The lysosome's job is mostly to break down very large things like, um, let's say, proteins and, uh, and fats and things like that will get broken down within the lysosome. But complex carbs, okay, starches and things like that, are typically broken down within the smooth ER. And they're just, all that happens is they cut the chains. Okay? If, if you have a, a big, long starch molecule, you can cut that into about four or five sections, depending on how big the starch is. And those four or five sections will all be glucose. All right? And so that's what your smooth ER does. Is it simply makes the, the starches shorter. All right? Where do you get starch from? What kind of things are starchy? Potatoes are starchy. 
Uh, corn does have some starch in it. Yep. Rice is starchy. Okay. Bread. Yeah. Okay. It's going to have some starch in it. Um, things like that. All right. So anything that's essentially got carbs in it is going to have some starches. Okay. If you ever, if you've ever had soda crackers, okay, they have starch in them. Um, for us, the digestion of starch actually starts in your mouth. All right. That's why if you've ever eaten a soda cracker, if while you're chewing it, it gets sweeter. Right? When you first put it in, it's just kind of bland, but as you chew it, it starts to get sweeter because one of the enzymes produced in your saliva is amylase, and it breaks down starch into sugar. So if you're chewing on a soda cracker, the starches start to break down in your mouth, and it will taste sweeter as you eat it. Okay? You don't believe me, try it. Okay? Have lots of water on hand, though. You can't eat like a bag of crackers without some water. It gets nasty. Okay. Um, hormones are produced here. All right? So lots of the hormones that our body needs are produced within the smoothie are, especially the fat-soluble ones. All right? Your steroid hormones are more protein-like, and so they're produced by the ribosomes. Okay? Um, and the other thing that's in here, that's done in here, drugs and poisons are detoxified within the smoothie are. All right? Reason for that? They're toxic. We don't want them touching any other parts of the cell. It would be logical to put them in, in the part of the cell that, if damaged, can repair itself most effectively. The smoothie R is the thing that makes fats to repair membranes, so throw the really rotten stuff in there because it can fix itself. Right. So if you were looking at a liver cell, would it have lots of smoothie R in it? Yes. Okay. Kidney cells, kind of similar. They would have a lot of smoothie R as well. All right. Whereas your muscle cells don't have very much. Because right. they're mostly concerned with contracting and, and they'll, they'll just send the toxins to the liver and the liver will deal with them. Okay. All right. Questions on the ER, the smooth ER? Okay. Uh, lipids can be moved. The, the smooth ER is often attached, attached at many points, in fact, to the cell membrane. Reason for that? The stuff that fixes the cell membrane is produced in the smoothie art. It allows it to quickly transport stuff to the membrane. All right. Also allows any of the toxic materials from the breakdown of drugs and poisons and things like that to quickly be sent to the cell membrane and excreted. Okay, that is sent out of the cell somewhere else. Okay. All right. Now, uh, sorry, we didn't talk about rough ER in there, but rough ER transports protein. Okay, so the rough ER okay, transports protein. That's its primary job. Okay, and you can see here in this um, in this magnified picture here. This is rough ER that we're looking at right here because you can see all the ribosomes on it. Okay, each one of these dots, okay, in this area here is is a is a ribosome on the the rough ER. But over here, notice the lack of ribosomes. Over here is the smooth ER under a microscope. Okay, so this section here, the smooth ER tends to be kind of more wrapped around itself, whereas the rough ER tends to be a little bit more linear or stacked. Okay, as the case may be. All right, the Golgi apparatus. Like we said before, the Golgi apparatus is the garbage man of the cell. It doesn't do a lot of processing, okay? It's just responsible for getting stuff out, all right? So stuff comes in on one side, and it leaves from the other, always. Nothing ever comes in the shipping side, okay, of the, of the Golgi apparatus. So it's the shipping and receiving kind of part of the cell. The cis face is the part of the Golgi apparatus that receives the waste products. So all the waste products come in on this side, go into the Golgi, and the membrane of the Golgi is always building. All right? And pieces of it come off, called a vesicle. Inside of that vesicle is the waste material. We don't want waste material to come into contact with the parts of our cell because it could be harmful. So these vesicles, Okay, here and here that are coming off of the Golgi head straight to the cell membrane. Right? When they get to the cell membrane, because the vesicle and the cell membrane are made of the same material, they just kind of merge. All right? And whatever was in the, uh, the vesicle just kind of pops out 
and into the uh, into the interstitial space. That's the stuff, the space between the cells. All right. So um, I'm trying to think of an analogy for that, and I'm drawing a blank here. But essentially, that that vesicle just comes into contact with the membrane, merges with the membrane, and then it's open to the outside of the cell, and everything just kind of pops out. All right, and it's out of the cell. The cell isn't necessarily, you know, it just kind of chucks its garbage over the fence. Right? Out of sight, out of mind, let something else deal with it. Well, if you're a single-celled organism, that's not really a problem because outside of the cell is somewhere else. Okay, It's in the water or it's wherever you live. Right? Within your own body, if stuff gets out of the cell and into the spaces within the cell, it'll probably fairly quickly move to where? Into the blood. Does your blood essentially run everywhere? Right? Like you've got really small capillaries that kind of run everywhere. Stuff will naturally move into those capillaries and the blood will transport it to an organ that can process it or it'll send it to the kidneys where it'll be removed. Okay? Where it'll be you know, put into your urine and, and you'll get rid of it that way. Right? So all of those things are kind of how the cell gets rid of its uh, material. Now, you can see here in this picture, because this is what it looks like again under an electron microscope. Okay? On, this is the Golgi right here, okay? this part. And you can see that the waste material comes in. It's in very small packages, right? It's, you know, single things coming in. But it, when it leaves this side of the Golgi, you can see that there's all kinds of these vesicles, these bubble-looking things, all right? They are headed to the membrane, and when they get to the membrane, they'll just pop whatever is in them outside. Does that sort of make sense? Okay. All right, so if I asked you what the function of the Golgi apparatus was on a quiz or a unit exam, you would say getting rid of waste. That would, that would be acceptable. Don't write garbage, man. You can use that to remind you of what it does, but don't write garbage, man. <laughs> All right. Lysosomes. Okay, we talked about those already. They're present only in what kind of cell? Animal cells. Only in animal cells because obviously plants don't eat food, all right, so they don't need um, organelles capable of digesting it. All right, so we've got a food vacuole coming in. Okay, food is typically when it hits the membrane is enveloped, okay, through a process called um, phagocytosis. All right, it would be if you've ever had to clean up after your dog, okay, right, you, you put the plastic bag over your hand, right, and you pick up the poop, and then you wrap the plastic bag, you kind of invert it, that's phagocytosis, okay? It's exactly like that, okay? It grabs stuff and it just turns it inside out, except when it turns inside out, it's now inside the cell, all right? Then the, the lysosome, okay, comes from the Golgi apparatus, actually. That's got all the enzymes in it, or a peroxisome, kind of merges with that and digests the food particle, all right? It'll also digest damaged um, organelles, your cell is kind of the ultimate recycler. And so if it notices that, you know, in this case, a mitochondria is no longer working properly, it'll just eat it okay, and recycle that material. Why not, right? It's, it's a lot of raw material. We might as well use it again. Okay? Remember, it does have that strong membrane because it's got to protect the rest of the cell from the, the harmful digestive enzymes that are in there. All right. These are also the suicide pill of the cell. All right. If you ever watch James Bond, right, they all have the, like the cyanide capsule in their tooth. Okay. Well, this is the cyanide capsule of the cell. If the cell realizes that it's broken and could be harmful to its surrounding cells or to your body or whatever, it will pop all of the lysosomes inside of it. Okay. And those lysosomes will then, the stuff that was in them, will digest and eat the cell. Okay. It's called cell lysis. And it that's how a cell kills itself. Okay, if if the case is if if that is required. All right, so they're very altruistic. All right, um, now the mitochondria. Okay, the mitochondria's job, like we said, is to break down sugar into energy. Okay, that energy is called ATP. You're not going to need to remember that. Okay, you'll learn about that in bio twenty. But that's what it does. It, it burns the sugar to produce okay, this energy. Now, when we say burn, I don't mean there's actually little fires going on inside of this organelle. That's not the case. But the process of breaking down sugars releases a lot of heat. All right? 
that heat is a byproduct that has to be slowly dissipated okay, within the cell. Now, there's a double membrane that acts as an insulator, protects the rest of the cell against that heat, okay, but it is all done in there. Right? Your body can control the rate at which these things burn sugar. Right? Um, if you have, you know, some people say, oh, I have a really slow metabolism or I have a really high metabolism, that has to do with essentially how quickly they convert energy particles or energy fuel within their body into ATP. Right? If that process is very slow, the body senses that it has a buildup of excess energy and converts that into fat. All right. If you have a very high metabolism, you can pretty much eat whatever you want and you never gain a pound and you're everyone hates you and yeah okay um, enjoy it while you have it guys it eventually slows down it's called age and it knows where you live and it's coming for you okay. all right um, so you got this double membrane it's got lots of folds in it the folds the purpose of the folds is to increase the surface area where these reactions can occur. All right? Lots of things within our body have these folds because it makes more surface area. And surface area is important when it comes to absorption okay, and things like that. All right? If you imagine if, if these folds weren't here, then the inside of the mitochondria would just look like that. How much surface area does that have compared to all of these yellow lines that go back and forth? Which one has more? The yellow lines. All right. Um, your intestine is the same way. If you ever look at your intestine under a microscope, okay, it's not just a tube. Okay, we think it's just this tube like this, like a hose, but it's not. The inside of it has all of these things called villi, which are folds. They're on both sides, and they make a lot of surface area. In fact, if you were to lay out your intestine one like, and with all the surface area that's inside of it, it could cover a tennis court. Yeah. Okay, that's how much surface area there is for absorbing energy and food within your small intestine, enough to cover a tennis court. All right? I mean, you think about your intestine, right? Like it's all kind of wrapped around and kind of inside of you, right? Like it's it's not just you know a, a, a tube that runs directly from A to B. It runs back and forth, back and forth, and inside of that are a whole bunch more folds. Oh well, your intestine, if you didn't unroll it. Like, or if, if you just had the tube, would reach from one end to the other, okay, about. But if I was to um, take the surface area of it, okay, that would be lay it out one cell thick all over the, it would cover the entire tennis court, not just stretch from one end to the other, all right? So you have a lot of surface area to absorb stuff within your intestine, okay? All right, the chloroplasts, only present where? Plant cells. Their job, obviously, they carry out photosynthesis. They also have a double membrane because a fair amount of heat is generated through photosynthesis, and that all has to be uh, sort of dissipated slowly, so there's a kind of an insulative factor there as well. Inside of there are things called thylakoids. They look like stacks of coins. Okay, they're not, obviously, but um, that's essentially where the chlorophyll is concentrated in the process of you know having those electrons jump from one level to the next and then come back down and release their energy. That's where all of that happens. Okay? If you look at a chloroplast under an electron microscope, this is what it looks like. And you can see here are those stacks of coins. Okay, That's kind of what they look like uh, in real life. What's that? Yeah, the cartoon's always kind of easier to imagine, right? All right. Any questions on the chloroplasts? What should you write for function of chloroplasts? Yeah. I, include the word photosynthesis in your description of what the chloroplasts do, and you're good. Okay, other organelles and their functions. Okay, so other things that kind of are just kind of quick. The cell membrane controls these two processes, endocytosis and exocytosis. Okay, um, cytosis means movement in and out of the cell. Okay, endo means into the cell. Exo means out of the cell. All right, so um, it controls that. Your cell membrane is like a border guard. Okay, it inspects everything before it comes into the country. Well, your cell membrane inspects anything before it comes into the cell, and it can determine whether it's going to reject the entry of anything or allow the entry of anything. Okay, it is the it is what we call selectively permeable. 
okay, or semi-permeable. It can it has the ability essentially to determine what gets in or out. Now, it isn't a layer like a plastic bag. That's kind of what we envision, right? But it isn't. It actually looks a lot more like this picture here. Right? It's made of um, fats, obviously, um, but it's a double layer. Okay, and the fats, fat usually does what with water? Yeah, it separates, it repels it. Okay, fat repels water. And so that enables, having, having your cell membrane made of fat enables you to keep water that you like within the cell and water from elsewhere out of the cell because it can't cross. All right? It can't cross unless the cell membrane allows it to. All right? um, there are also um, special kinds of proteins that are embedded in this. So imagine your cell membrane is like jello, but the jello's got stuff in it, okay? Like grapes and raisins and, and, and stuff like that within the jello. All right? That's what your cell membrane would look like if you could see it. Okay? There's stuff embedded in it. And each one of these things that's embedded within your cell membrane has a job. Some of them are receptors. Okay? They're like antennas for certain chemical signals that your body sends to cells. All right? It isn't like your car where one antenna can pick up lots of radio stations. It needs one antenna for every radio station. So it's got lots of these kind of receivers all over the surface of it so that it can respond to this hormone or that hormone or this chemical signal, okay? And they're all kind of on there. So it is kind of a, a jungle, okay, when you look at it as opposed to just this layer that we kind of envision, okay? Cell wall, okay? Obviously, this is the one on a plant cell because animal cells don't have them, okay? Um, it keeps the shape and supports the cell made of cellulose fiber. This is what it looks like under a microscope, an electron microscope, right? You can see why it doesn't control what gets in and out, okay? It serves no protective function whatsoever because like we said last week, it's like a house that's been framed but not sheeted, okay? So it's just the studs. You can walk right between them and get into the house because there's no boards on the outside yet. Everybody follow? Okay, so that's all the cell wall does. It's just a frame, okay, that supports the cell itself. Okay. All right. Uh, the water vacuole, okay, like we said, present only in the animal, or sorry, in the plant cell, not the animal cell, okay, uses turgor pressure, okay? That's the pressure of water to support the cell from within. Okay, and the centrioles, okay, those are only in animal cells, and this is kind of what they do, all right? Um, when it's time for the cell to divide, it sends all of its, it collects all of its DNA into chromosomes that look like this, and those chromosomes all end up right in the middle of the cell. It's called the metaphase plate, okay, and they all kind of line up right there in the middle, all right? The centrioles send out fibers. Right, one from each side to grab onto these chromosomes. And they pull them apart and make sure that one gets to each side of the cell so that the new cell has all the DNA it's supposed to have. All right, so that's essentially their job. And then once that's done, they replicate so that each new cell has two for the next time it divides. Everybody with me there? So essentially, if you're writing down what the centriole does, it helps with cell division. That would probably be good enough. All right. And then lastly, microfibers and microfilaments help the cell stay intact during changes in shape. Okay, questions on what any of the parts of the cell do? Right. So that guys, that's going to be pretty much strictly memorization. Once in a while there might be an application type of question like, what would happen to a cell if it didn't have this? Don't answer die. Okay, I want a more specific answer than that. Okay, but you get the idea. All right, now, transport within the cell. Okay, and then obviously we'll talk about transport across the membrane as well. Within the cell, there is only one way that stuff gets moved. Okay, when it's in the cytoplasm, when it's in your body outside of a cell and just in the fluid, okay, in the air here, Everything moves by the same process. That process is diffusion. Okay? Diffusion is the most commonly used form of transport within the cell, outside the cell, anywhere. 
Okay? Diffusion works like this, and I say it this way not for a laugh, but because you won't forget it. Diffusion works like a fart. Okay? If someone in one corner of the room farts, and you're close by, it's bad, because it's very concentrated. But eventually, everyone begins to detect the fart. Okay? The further away from the source of the fart you were, the less concentrated it is. Agreed? Okay? And eventually it just kind of dissipates and no one notices it anymore. All right? Even if it was a silent but violent one. Okay? Um, we still end up with okay, this dissipation. How does it do that? Well, it does that because all molecules are always moving. Okay? Even in the air here, the particles, the air, you know, the, the molecules within the air, the nitrogen, the oxygen, they're always moving. All right? As they move, okay, they can bump other molecules and allow them to move and eventually it just spreads out. Everything always moves from being very concentrated to being less concentrated. Nothing wants to be crowded. All right? Does everyone follow me on that? Okay, so if you have uh, something that's very concentrated in one place, it dissipates out. All right? it's, I mean, it's the whole reason why so many animals use scent to find their, their prey. All right? If they follow the increasing concentration of the scent, will it lead them to the source of the scent? Yes, okay, and that's that's why we do that. Okay, you know, if you or I are, uh, you know, at the, at the mall, you can always follow your nose to the food court, all right, because it gets oh, New New York fries. You know, you can smell the deep fry. You can get closer. Okay, you just it gets stronger and stronger. You know, you're getting closer. All right, that's how we do that. Well, it's because it diffuses out. That smell, okay, the molecules that that we detect with our nose diffuse outwards and we detect a couple of them okay and we get a little closer there's more of them the smell gets stronger and stronger and stronger as we get closer okay that's what diffusion is okay a good example of it here is just putting dye into a pool okay if you put dye into a pool all right it naturally spreads out if you put a you know one drop of food coloring into a glass of water is eventually the whole water the whole glass of water blue or whatever color it was yeah all right, because it naturally diffuses and becomes evenly distributed. All right, that's essentially what diffusion will always do: is evenly distribute things. Does it require any energy from your cell? No. That's why it's so so readily used. It's a natural process that is what we call passive. Okay, it's passive transport because it requires no energy from the cell. Now. As you probably have experienced in your life, especially if you've bought anything from the App Store or the iTunes Store, you get what you pay for. If it's free, it probably is all right, but not great. Okay, your paid apps are always just a little bit better, right? Because well, someone's put in a little more effort to make them. All right, they suck you in with the free version, okay, and then you know you upgrade and you pay a little bit. Well. Diffusion works. It will get stuff from one place to another. But it won't do it fast, and it won't target it either. All right? It's not like FedEx or UPS. All right? It is not going to go from A to B. It's going to go from A everywhere. Some of it will end up at B. All right? Generally, though, okay, it works pretty well, because if you need something at location B, it's probably not very concentrated there. Would you agree? And everything naturally moves from an area where it's very concentrated to where it is less concentrated. So more stuff would move towards the area where it's not very concentrated. And so as a result, diffusion works pretty well. However, if it has to go very far, how much of it's going to get there? Not as much. Because what's happening to this dye in this picture as it gets further away from the source? Yeah, it gets thinner and thinner and thinner. So diffusion works fine as long as it's in a small cell. If you wanted diffusion to work from one corner of the room to the other, it's not great. It takes a long time. All right? And by the time it gets all of that distance, most of whatever was diffusing has gotten so diffuse that you can't even detect it anymore. All right? Which is why you like being on the other side of the room from a fart. Okay? You generally don't get it as bad as the people right next to it. Everybody follow? All right. So diffusion is nice in that it's free, but you get what you pay for. It's not, you're not going to make sure, there's no guarantee it gets where you want it. It's very slow, 
and it only works over short distances. Okay, so a few things to remember, right? Slow, not targeted. Okay, and only works over small distances. Which, within a cell, isn't usually a problem. A cell isn't very big. Okay, so diffusion can work okay, within a cell. Even though it's slow, it can still work because it doesn't have to go very far. All right. Would we be able to use diffusion to supply f you know, the nutrients and stuff from our food to all the parts of our body, especially our brain? No. Okay. That's way too far. And it's against gravity. All right. and it's just not going to work. Okay. That's why we have a circulatory system. It actively uses energy to pump stuff where we need it to go. All right, questions on diffusion? Okay, so generally the passive movement from concentrated to less concentrated. All right, osmosis. Osmosis is the second most important method of cellular transport. But it's weird. Osmosis only transports one thing, water. Okay, really important that we remember that. Osmosis is the passive transport of only water. Nothing else moves by osmosis. Okay, and osmosis always happens okay, across a cell membrane. It doesn't happen within the cell, it's how water gets in or out of the cell through the membrane. What happens if you pour salt on a slug? Cool things. It shrivels up, right? Okay. If it shrivels up, what's coming out of it? Water. All right. You and I are lucky. Our skin works a lot better than the skin of a slug. All right. The skin of a slug is essentially just exposed cells. Okay. And so when you pour salt on it, water's natural tendency is this: it wants to make concentrations of solute, salts, whatever it happens to be, the same on both sides of the membrane, the same inside as it is outside. So what happens is water moves to the area where there's lots of salt or solute. Okay? It moves from the area where there's very little to the area where there's a lot because there's less water. It's still obeying the diffusion rules. It's going from lots of water to less water. So if you pour salt on a slug, the water moves out of the slug to the salt, which is why the slug shrivels up. Everybody follow me on that one? Okay. It's why you and I can't drink salt water. Okay. If I'm out on the ocean in a lifeboat and I start drinking salt water, right, what my body does is it needs to draw water from my cells in order to balance the concentration of salt that I've brought in. Okay. Is that making it better or worse for me? Worse. I want the water to get into my cells, but if I drink salt water, there's so much salt in it that my body will draw water, well it's not my body actually doing it, it's just the water naturally moving out of my cells and into whatever fluids have the salt in it. So I actually get more dehydrated as a result of drinking salt water. Okay? In fact, if you're stranded on the ocean with no water, for the first day, day and a half, you're actually better off drinking your own urine than drinking the seawater. For the first day, as you get more dehydrated, your urine becomes more concentrated, and then it becomes like drinking salt water. <laughs> okay, but at least for the first day, you're actually better off. I know that sounds really gross, but you're actually better off doing that for the first day. Yes, if you distill it, what happens in distillation? What you do is you boil the water. Okay, you turn all the water into a vapor. All the salt gets left behind. You condense that water back down into a liquid and then you can drink it. It's essentially distilled water then at that point. Okay? And then you could drink it. You could also use reverse osmosis, which is artificial process that we'll talk about later, um, that forces water through an artificial membrane. The membrane is small enough that none of the salts will get through, only the water. Okay? So it's essentially just a big filter. But it makes it's the opposite. Instead of making both sides equal, reverse osmosis actually makes one side really concentrated and one side all water. Right? But you have to put energy in to make reverse osmosis happen. Right? Natural osmosis means water balances concentration on both sides. 
Yes, it is. And not very scientifically accurate either. Okay, so here's what would happen. And you actually do this in bio 20 or 30, I can't remember which now. Um, you do this experiment with this U-shaped tube, okay? And in this U-shaped tube, you put a piece of sausage casing, all right? What's sausage casing made out of? Intestine, yeah, okay? And intestine is obviously made out of cells, all right? So you put this piece of sausage casing. It's only about one cell layer thick, maybe a little more than that, okay? And you put it in here, and you put really salty water on one side, and you put like lightly salted or even distilled water on the other. Now here's what will happen. Water will start moving across the membrane because osmosis is a natural passive process. Water will start moving this way until the water on both sides of the membrane has the same concentration of salt. All right. So if this side is just distilled water, all the water will move across because there's no salt on this side. All right. If this is lightly salted, then some of the water will move across, and this is what you'll actually see happen. Within a few hours, the water level on the salty side will be higher than it was on the lightly salted side. Okay, And now both sides will have the same concentration of salt. All right. But obviously, if you had more salt on this side, you needed more water. Okay, Everybody with me there? All right. So if I take one of my cells, okay, and I put it in normal, what we call isotonic conditions, that means balanced within my body, the amount of water going in and the amount of water going out of my cells is the same. Okay, it's balanced. It doesn't mean there's no movement, it just means the net movement is the same. If I put one of my cells into what we call hypertonic solutions, that means I put it in a solution of salt water, heavily salted salt water, okay, then water moves out of my cell passively, without any energy, out of the cell and into the salt water, causing my cell to shrivel up. Okay. By the same token, if I put one of my cells into distilled water, water rushes in to the cell. Because are there naturally salts within your cell? Some. And there's no salts in distilled water. So there's no way to achieve a balance, is there? Right? It will be impossible for there to be a balance between inside and outside. So water just keeps rushing into your cell until it pops. Okay. You don't ever have to worry about that situation happening in your own body. But if you did it with a single cell, that's what would happen. If you threw a single cell into distilled water, water would just rush into it until it burst. Okay. So if you um, put a slug in distilled water, it would swell up. It'd probably drown too, but it would swell up. Okay. All right. Okay. So does that make sense to everybody? So the big things to remember here about osmosis: it's passive, doesn't require any energy whatsoever, and it's movement of water, okay, across the membrane, and we're doing that to gain equilibrium. Okay. We're balancing the concentration of solutes. Okay, last form of transport, um, last type, sorry, there's three types, and then we'll talk more about kind of the subcategories of them. The last type is the opposite of the first two, okay? The first two are passive, didn't require any energy from your cell. The last kind is active transport, okay? Diffusion and osmosis can only ever create balance, all right? They're never going to make concentrations on one side more than the other. Okay? They can only ever create balance because they're passive. Active transport creates imbalance. It causes imbalance. It concentrates one thing okay, into one place. But in order to do that, you have to use what? Energy. All right? You have to use energy in order for that to happen. Okay? So the big thing about active transport is it's the pumping of solutes against the gradient. Okay? The gradient means from high to low. All right? Active transport goes from low to high. Okay? But you, it's like going uphill. All right? Active transport is going uphill. You don't roll uphill. Okay? You have to climb. You have to push up the hill. All right? You can roll down the hill. That's free. Okay? But to go up the hill requires energy. 
All right, so the cell has to expend energy and it will create imbalance. It is the only one that will do so. So when, when I give you a question on a unit exam, you have to read the context carefully to figure out which type of cellular transport I'm talking about. Okay, if I'm talking about a, you know, a need, a situation where there's a need to create imbalance, the process has to be active transport because the other two won't do it. All right. If I'm talking about a, a process or a situation where only water needs to move, I'm talking about osmosis. Okay. And if I'm talking about just a passive movement of anything, it's probably diffusion. Okay. Those are kind of the big, you always got to know the key characteristics of the three types. All right. Now, active transport works by moving some of the proteins that are embedded within your membrane. Okay, because there are special things called carrier proteins okay, within your membrane. The stuff that we want pumped into the cell gets into those uh, gates, essentially. Carrier proteins form gates. When that stuff gets in there, energy is used to snap the gate shut on one side and open it on the other. And that will pump that stuff in and not allow it back out. Okay. Only problem with active transport is that osmosis is always un trying to undo it. All right, but the good news is, is that osmosis won't pull the stuff active transport's pumped in. It'll only bring in water. All right, so it can't really undo the process of active transport, but it can start diluting the stuff once it gets in. But active transport will pull stuff in fast. All right, that's the advantage of it. It pulls it in really, really quickly. And that's important, especially if you're a nerve cell or a muscle cell, because you need to transport sodium and potassium really, really quickly if you're a muscle cell or a nerve cell. That's how nerve impulses are transmitted, and it's how muscles uh, contract. Calcium as well, really important for contraction and relaxation of muscles. Okay? Uh, you get a cramp if you're not getting that, um, that process to happen quickly enough, or you've lost enough electrolytes in your sweat that you can't relax your muscle properly. Okay? And that's when you get a cramp. All right. Um, so now these are sort of examples of the of ways that your cell actively moves things. Okay. Active transport is generally just a pumping of something. These are other forms of transport your cell does that aren't really included in the first three. Okay. Exocytosis we talked about because that's the job of the Golgi apparatus. Okay. It uses energy because the Golgi apparatus has got to you know make the vesicles and push them towards the membrane. You can see here, this vesicle just merges with the membrane, becomes part of the membrane, and whatever was in it pops out of the cell. All right. Everybody with me there? So that's exocytosis, any movement of out of the cell within a vesicle. Okay, So there has to be a vesicle present for exocytosis to be going on. Okay, endocytosis, movement into the cell, can be done in a few ways. Okay, we could have phagocytosis, which we talked about a little while ago. That's the engulfing of a solid food particle. Pinocytosis is exactly the same, except there's no food particle, it's just fluid. If your cells need to bring in fluid even faster than osmosis could make it happen, then they will actually engulf fluid, it's cell drinking, gulps, it gulps in fluid, okay, by engulfing it and bringing it into the cell. And then lastly is receptor mediated endocytosis. We said your cell membrane's got all these antennas over it. When those antennas get their signal, it's actually a, a molecule that sticks to it. And then the cell will engulf that. S same as phagocytosis, it will engulf it, receptors and all, into the cell. All right, and that's how your cell brings in uh, large hormone molecules. They're big proteins that can't be just absorbed through the membrane. They have to be engulfed and brought in. Okay, so they hit the receptors, then they move in. All right, just a little bit different. All right, so just to show you kind of the pictures here, okay, phagocytosis, like we said, engulf it, bring it in, digest it, and you're done. Okay, pinocytosis drinks it in, okay, the fluid comes in like that. You actually see here, here's an electron microscope picture of it happening. Okay, the cell actually makes these little bulbs and the fluid goes in and then they move into the cell. And for receptor mediated, okay, you can actually see the antennas here. You can see the little receptor molecules right here and they've got the stuff on them. Okay, you can see it here inside of the vesicle. Here's the vesicle being pinched kind of off from the membrane inside. 
Alrighty. Questions on any of that? Alright, I think we actually got close to through that, didn't we? Sweet. Alright, um, we'll talk about those uh, questions for review tomorrow because the bell's going to go here right away. Yes, that's why those were taken. Those aren't the, that's not one after the other. That's two separate cells, different stages of the same process. No.